everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome again to Concrete Paving Technology on Tuesday. This week we try once again for session one of the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center ADA webinar series. And we truly apologize for last week's technical difficulties and these challenging times for communication technology too. We've had a lot of conversation this week, a lot of phone calls with technical people. We hope that we have some resolution to some of the problems that we had last week. And, uh, and we have this week, as you probably know, uh, added another session so that we can control the numbers a little bit better. So we're ready to go with session one and looking forward to uh, sharing this with you. Just a word about the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center at Iowa State University. We're a national resource for concrete pavement research and technology transfer. Since 2005, we have been at the nexus of agency, industry, and academia, working in partnership with all three of those entities to help advance the art and science of concrete pavement technology. We have a lot of supporters. Uh, Industry support uh, comes from Portland Cement Association, uh, the American Concrete Pavement Association, the Iowa Concrete Paving Association, and the many chapters of the, uh, of the uh, ACPA in addition. We also have support from the Iowa DOT. We work with information that's been provided uh, through some of our work with the National Concrete Consortium, and also have support and work with the Federal Highway Administration. We are greatly indebted for their support that enabled us to provide these seminars and webinars to you free of charge. Questions are definitely encouraged throughout the webinar. You'll see there's a question box. We encourage you to enter your questions in that box. And uh, because of the time constraints and also our intent to uh, be able to respond to everybody's questions. We will take those questions and answer them and electronically submit uh, the summary of those to you here in a few days. PDH certificates are available and will be sent electronically to those who are requesting them. And the presentations and recordings will be posted on the CP Tech website. As mentioned, Today is the ADA, first of the ADA webinar series. It's going to focus on planning and design ADA guidelines for DOT and municipalities. You know, every professional that's engaged in road construction today becomes involved in ADA, the American with Disabilities Act. This session centers on the planning and design, understanding the rules and requirements of ProRAG 2011, will be the stepping off point for our seminar today. We're glad to be joined by Jesse Jonas, who will be speaking today. And just a reminder that next week on May 26th, once again, offering the webinar at, at noon and another at 1.30, uh, repeat at 1.30. Our focus next week will be how are the states implementing ProWAG? And we'll have an in-depth look at Wisconsin and Missouri's approaches to ADA compliance. We do have learning objectives for our webinars for those that are gaining the PDH hours. Today, you will gain a better understanding of the challenges faced by pedestrians with various mobility limitations in the public right-of-way. You should learn the requirements and purpose of completing an ADA transition plan, and you will achieve an in-depth understanding of the proposed guidelines detailed in Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines, or ProWAG 2011. We're very privileged today uh, to thank Missouri Kansas Chapter of ACPA for loaning uh, their Director of Engineering, Jesse Jonas, to us for the presentation. Jesse's going to give you a, a great overview of ADA and how it impacts those people who we're trying to to accommodate. Jesse's a graduate from the University of Missouri in Rolla, and uh, he, where he received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering. He served as, uh, in positions for the Missouri DOT, St. Louis County, private industry, and now as director of engineering for the Missouri Kansas chapter of ACPA. Jesse is a certified ADA coordinator, 
through the Great Plains ADA Resource Center and has given numerous presentations on the importance of ADA compliance. So with that, welcome, Jesse. Thank you for helping us out, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Gordon and Bill, and thank you, everybody who's online with us today. Uh, we got a lot to cover in the next 50, 55 minutes, so if you don't mind, I will just go ahead and jump right on in. And I'm going to start this presentation with a question. Why is the ADA compliance so important? Well, as we look at this, this first bullet right here, it is so important for us to understand as we're designing and building the right of way for our constituents, our customers, clients, one in five of them have some sort of a disability that they're living with. And, you know, I kind of comically say they're not required to wear shirts explaining what that is. Um, so you don't see them uh, differently than you'd see anybody else out in the right of way. Most users aren't in wheelchairs or using canes, yet there are some out there that do. But there's a lot of folks with cognitive disabilities, um, hearing, uh, speech, all different kinds, mobility, and they represent a very large percentage of those we're serving. So that's, a, that's one of the big reasons why we're focusing on this today. Um, it is 20% of our community, and some would argue that the number's even higher. Uh, and it's the barriers. It's the barriers that prevent them from enjoying the right of way the same way you or I do. And throughout this presentation, we hope to give you a couple examples where you can real life it kind of for yourself. Because throughout our lives, a lot of us have been in crutches for a surgery or uh, you go to the eye doctor and you get the glaucoma test and well, you can't see very well for a while or uh, more modern times, you think about the masks that we're wearing and how they're fogging up your glasses. Uh, there's there's folks that that see this way and move this way their whole lives, and the right of way can become very challenging if we don't understand how to incorporate their needs into our planning and projects. But you see this 3% cross slope as an example. I bet almost everybody online today has pushed a wheelbarrow of dirt or concrete in your lives. So think about when that wheelbarrow gets overloaded to one side. You may just be going from your front yard to your backyard, but the amount of effort in that hand to keep that wheelbarrow going straight and from tipping and dumping, it's exhausting. And by the time you're done with your short trip, you are so glad you are done with your short trip. You might also be even thinking about if you would have only set that wheelbarrow down halfway through and adjusted the weight load, it would have been a lot easier on you. Well, that's, you know, folks in wheelchairs, when we go 1% over compliance, that's 50% more exertion that they're putting into that hand. That's countering them from being taken into traffic or the grass. So the right of way becomes very, very challenging. And yet as we walk it, you would never know the difference between 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%, 6 But when you have a different need, it changes drastically. So. We're going to try and share those examples today. And then the bottom one, the reality is, is the legal factor is, is out there. And, and if you don't know about it by now, you don't have to search very hard to find it. Um, there are a lot of uh, case laws, case studies out there, a lot of cities, counties, states that end in consent decrees. So we want to take this into our own hands. We want to be proactive instead of reactive. And that kind of takes us to wah, 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 a disclaimer here, right? What I'm saying in this is what we're teaching today is PROAG 2011. And PROAG stands for Public Rights Away Accessibility Guidelines. So we're presenting the guidelines to the best of our knowledge, to the best of our understanding. And um, you may see things slightly different in your city, county, state. Um, and even in session two, you'll hear how some things are being done differently from state to state, and that's okay. What we want to share is as we teach today, we're teaching the minimum guidelines. So these are published by the Access Board, which is a federal agency, and these tend to represent the minimum guidelines. So it's incumbent on everybody to realize what their local uh, rules regarding ADA compliance are because cities and county can certainly meet or exceed the guidelines with their local expectations. 
So we just wanted to share that. Another thing I hope to get across today is that we're not talking about building wheelchair ramps. We're not here talking about ADA sidewalks. We're here talking about how accessibility is safety. And most all of us online understand that word safety extremely well. And when we realize that access equals safety, you saw that one in five Americans have a disability, but what we're talking about today is building something for 100% of Americans. And hopefully that picture illuminates as well as, as we continue on in this. Because everybody in this picture right here knows somebody who needs no help tripping. So when you enter a curve into the picture, things change and, and now we've got a, an obstacle. And then we enter technology into the picture. Just like it failed us last week, you see these guys walking with their head down their phone. You know, if a sewer lid's open, you could lose a buddy out in the right of way. So these are things that we need to be cognizant of is what we're building and, and who we're building it for. Access equals safety. Because that red painted curve is not going to help this little guy too much. It may give cues and indications to others, but, but we're trying to accommodate everyone. And you're going to see me in a wheelchair in a little while, and you're going to come to know that this just isn't possible for most users. But let's talk about how many users are out there. Maybe we forget about a large portion of our public that does move around in wheels. If you look at this picture, look at that growth in the background. I see somebody crossing an intersection. And what I see is that sight distance issue in the background could present a real problem if a car is coming and taking a right turn, a hard right turn. And what I want is for my loved ones to be able to get out of that road quickly, accessibly, and safely. So this becomes very hard if they need to move quick, if, if a situation would arise. So we have more users than we think out there. We don't want to be the group that takes them part of the way and then leaves them for not. And things like this seem absolutely silly. And, you know, I, I got a lot of, lot of architectural friends out there I joke with on this one. But then I follow up with saying, it's not just you guys. We do it in civil engineering too. And when we do it, sometimes we leave them in the middle of a road. So we have them out there. You know, we can humble ourselves and realize that we, we're learning this as we go. And these are the kind of things that we want to bring awareness to that, Putting in those curb cuts is absolutely vital to accessibility and certainly to safety for everybody. Because these little guys deserve a quick in and out of places. And so do these. There's a lot of users on wheels out there. Access equals safety. Which takes us into the transition plan. And I'm going to read that first bullet, first sentence. In accordance with federal law. This is a federal law. A lot of us maintain all parts of the right-of-way that are on the line today. And if you've got a PASER rated two road, there's no federal law that says you need to bring it up to any certain standard. But when we're talking about our pedestrian facilities out there, we do have federal laws that say we need to go out and identify what is not compliant. We need to put a dollar value in a list of when these things are gonna be brought up into compliance. We need to take a look at all of the features, whether it be the street crossings, the sidewalks, the curb ramps, the push buttons, the, the shared use paths. All of these things need to be surveyed and evaluated and determined to be in or out of compliance. And then we take our plan on how to bring them up to compliance to our public. And once we do this, you're gonna reach out to your advocacy groups. You're gonna reach out, put it on the website. You're going to try and solicit as much feedback and information as you can because your ADA transition plan is your document to say how you are going to come into compliance and that you have communicated this through a public meeting with your constituents. And as a organization, you all are together on this. So that's what a transition plan is meant to do, bring things into compliance with new construction and, and communicate with your public. So we talked about sidewalks and shared use paths. A lot of times when we talk about this, people think that the curb ramps are the only thing we're supposed to bring into compliance because we hear whenever we do resurfacings or alterations, we have to upgrade the curb ramps. We have to also upgrade the sidewalks and, and any place that draws pedestrian uh, travel. Because what the ADA says is what you make usable for some, you make accessible for all. And that's what we're after here. And as you look at that highlighted section, 
your sidewalks have been deemed a service program or activity, which makes them something that needs to be in compliance with the ADA. So here's a sky view of St. Louis County, and this is one level of GIS turned on. So you're gonna get all this data and have all this information. How are you gonna use it uh, functionally to help tell your story? Well, GIS is a fabulous way to do that. And here's an example of San Francisco. Now you can't really see much about those dots, but look at the color coding of them on the right there. What they're telling the public is that each of our intersections, we have some level of accessibility, whether fully compliant, uh, partially or not there yet. But as that public goes to their website and pulls up these GIS layers, they can zoom in and see what level of accessibility exists at each of these. And this is very important because one person's accessible route may be different from another one's. So as you gather all this data and collect it, here's a fabulous way that you can be transparent and share this with your public. So, this graphic on the left we've seen for years. It's the sustainable model. It's, it's that overlap of social, economical, and environmental. Look to the right, and I implore everybody to understand how this works for your transition plan as well. The social responsibility is the understanding that ADA law is an extension of civil rights law. This is our social responsibility to do this. The economic is a realization that we didn't get new money when this came about. So we have to fit it within the system that we already have in play, and that system has more needs than funding as is. So we got to figure out a way to get it in, um, in, in a way that works for how we do projects. Because then you got the environment side, and if we don't take into account of it, we'll be told how quickly we need to bring it all into compliance. So that transition plan is your method of reaching out to your public and saying, hey, here's who we are, Here's what we got. Here's our, our plan, our resources, our limitations. But between year A and B, we're going to bring this all up to compliance. What do you think? Well, as they talk to you and as you address their comments, now you've put together your group's plan because yours may be different than your neighboring county, city, state. So I encourage everybody, if you have not done your transition plan yet, uh, start it yesterday because it was supposed to be done between 1990 and 1995. So we're, we don't have a big leg to stand on when we don't have one. So that's all I'll say about that. So getting into the meat and potatoes here, this is a tabled intersection. You're gonna hear me refer to table intersections a lot throughout this presentation. And you're also gonna hear me refer to grade breaks perpendicular to the direction of travel. So if you look down at the bottom of these domes, Everything here was built so, so great. You got a good ramp connecting into what looks like a fairly level sidewalk path. You got a tabled intersection where they make the cars go up and over and allow that flat tabled spot to continue for the users. But notice in front of the domes, we've got two, two grade breaks on every ramp. You got a top grade break and you got a bottom grade break. Now in this per case, Grade brakes have got to be perpendicular to the direction of travel. So if you can imagine a wheelchair coming up off this ramp, when those two front wheels hit the top, they both leave the climb at the same time. That's good and that's what we want. But down here at the bottom, this grade brake went radially. So we're assuming that this ramp is climbing between five and 8.3%. And a radial grade brake is very, very challenging. It's not compliant and here's why. You see the picture where that one wheel comes off the ground? That's what happens when we don't have grade brakes perpendicular to the direction of travel. So we should have indented, as you see that this flat tabled approach, it should have continued into where those domes start and then the climb should have started. So that's what we're after. And this happens a lot out in the right of way. I see these very frequently throughout the whole country. We want to make sure that we are not radially installing a grade break. So now I'm going to attempt to play a video for you. And if this works, um, it will show up on your screen and it may not be maximized. So in your upper right hand corner will be the ability to maximize it. 
and I am going to give it a go right here and see if it shows up on my screen, which it does. Now I'm going to click play. So I will tell you this, that the volume is a little low on this. It was recorded on an iPhone, but it was suggested that with all the traffic noise in the background, uh, the genuineness and the real challenging concerns, um, it was more important that you just see and watch the wheelchair than how clear it comes through. Uh, because this is going to be very difficult. You're going to see me cross two drive approaches. And what we're going to highlight in this video is the challenges of grade brakes perpendicular to the direction of travel. So here we go. All right, so you can kind of see in that how challenging it is. Um, and that was just crossing two uh, drive approaches. So when we talk about accessibility and excessive cross slopes, if we get excessive cross slopes out there, it's just not a usable uh, facility for some folks. So here we talk about 
getting on the right page. 95%, um, technically speaking, is is still way off in some cases. And as you look at this, uh, again, you, you've got a situation where there probably was a grade bust. And in construction, you know, we usually just solve that with a with a step. But uh, that doesn't work in this this scenario. But what I'm hoping that you'll see is as silly as this looks to everybody that's delved in into ADA compliance and construction. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, this will look just as silly. That's seen through a different set of eyes. A simple threshold can stop people from entering uh, a building. And in fact, it did with my mom. So I tell the story about my mom. Two years ago, she became a wheelchair user for the rest of her life now. Uh, and, and in all the years prior, they were going to this restaurant down the street that her and dad liked a lot. And once she was in the wheelchair, she never realized there was a threshold to get into the place. Uh, but she sure did when she was in a wheelchair and she couldn't go over the front of it. So dad had to turn her around and try and back her up. Well, he's 75, he had troubles getting her over it. So they had to get some hotels or some uh, restaurant staff to help lift her over. And, and that's quite embarrassing. But here we got this situation where that bump in inside the pedestrian access route created an inaccessible uh, obstacle. So that was a barrier. And that's things that we're trying to eliminate. So which book are we gonna design by? ADAG or PROAG? Well, we got two books with two very different outcomes. ADAG is Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines. And then we already talked about PROAG. ADAG was more for buildings and PROAG is more recognizing the challenges of the right of way. Because in the right of way, the roads go up and down hills and mountains. And if we put sidewalks in, they're allowed to follow the grade of the road in PROAG. And that's a good thing. So we do want to use PROAG. While it hasn't been adopted at a national level yet or at the, the federal level, it has not been made law yet. Uh, we do expect that it will someday. But between then and now, you can adopt it. So part of your transition plan is looking at what standards you're going to use. And Department of Justice, Department of Justice has said that PROAG is the best guidance out there for the right of way. So if you adopt it and use it, you'll be defendable by it. So we, I encourage that um, if you haven't adopted PROAG, to use it because it, if you don't and you want to build what has been uh, passed, you're going to look at ADAG on the left. And when we're out in parks outside of the the public right of way to climb grade, we need to build those switchbacks that are on the left. But when you're following the road in the public right away, you can build what's on the right. It's called the road grade allowance. So learning to speak the language. So here we've got the very first thing, there's the PAR, pedestrian access route. And that is everything, everything below encompassing it. Think about the PAR as a lane of traffic. Because once we do that, we're gonna start looking at it differently. And that's very important. You got all these definitions below that the rest of the presentation is going to get into, but what you don't see here is ramp names and definitions. I, I don't uh, define a parallel ramp or a perpendicular ramp or a diagonal because what I'm trying to do and what I've found throughout years of delving into this and trying to build these things is once you understand each component and its rules and allowance, you can go out there and build a lot more ramps compliantly within the right-of-way space that you have than you probably once thought. And names get confusing. So this picture you're looking at right here is actually a single opening. It's, it's four foot wide or five foot wide. And it's serving two crosswalks. So by definition, one opening serving two crosswalks means it's a diagonal. But it's also a perpendicular because it ramps up to a turning space. It's also a parallel because it's ramping down to a turning space on either side, which makes it a combination ramp. So here, this one thing is all four, and you can see where naming things can get confusing. And if we get too hung up on it, we may be trying to fit square pegs into round holes by saying, I want XYZ ramp at an intersection. The PAR, think of it as a lane of traffic, and also realize that it's a four foot minimum clear path. So we don't, we don't get to go down to three feet. That's, that was in ADAG, that's in a building code. We're a four foot minimum, just so that everybody understands that. 
And when we think about it as a lane of traffic, this certainly seems silly in our vehicular lane of traffic, correct? So we want it to become just as silly when we think about it in our pedestrian lane of traffic. We can't be doing this anymore, and we need to move these that are in the way. And inside the PAR, general requirements, we get a quarter inch before we have to do any corrective measures, but I want you to know that we do not get that quarter inch where the ramp meets the street crossing. Where a ramp meets a street crossing, it has to be flush, and PROAG says that. Um, but anywhere else, when we're over a quarter inch, we need to start doing corrective measures and beveling it. In understanding a curb ramp, we must realize that there is an awful lot going on in that little space. And I'm going to try and move my cursor and see, hopefully this shows up for you. But this whole thing that my cursor is circling is the curb ramp. That whole thing is the curb ramp. This little piece of two slabs of sidewalk here that's going from street grade to sidewalk grade, that's the ramp. There's a ramp within the curb ramp, and that is what needs to have uh, your grade breaks perpendicular to the direction of travel. So we need to understand that that's the piece we're talking about when we're talking about grade breaks. Curb ramps also have turning spaces sometimes if there's a turning movement available. They have clear spaces. At the bottom of a ramp, think about a wheelchair coming off a flume. We need to give them clear space where there's no other things that they could run into. You know, you don't want a pole there blocking the way, a fire hydrant, cars. We'll get into that in a little bit. So these are all the different pieces of a curb ramp. In the curb ramp, we have cross slopes. And this part of PROAG has, has sometimes been a little confusing, but I'm gonna clarify it here today because I have gotten clarification from the access board on it as well. I'm gonna read this to you. The maximum cross slope is 2% with a target value of one and a half. So as designers and planners out there, we put one and a half on our plans because we want to give a little bit of wiggle room for the finish and the forms out in the field. 2% ultimately is, is still compliant, um, but we put that buffer in in design. Highlighted part, however, for intersection legs that do not have full stop or yield control and at mid-block crossings, the curb ramp cross slope is allowed to match the cross slope in the pedestrian street crossing. So if my pedestrian street crossing right now is falling at 7%, does that mean my cross slope of my ramp can be 7% and be compliant? The answer to that is no. Here's why. Remember, the point of a transition plan is to bring everything up to the requirements of new construction. And part of our transition plan needs to be a survey of the street crossings. And PROAG has already limited what the grade of that street can be. Anywhere you got a stop sign, the, the road has to be tabled to 2% maximum cross slope. So that means the grade of the road can fall no more than 2% at that street crossing. Just like that first picture where I said we had a really nice table. When we're at signalized intersections or places without stop or yield control, uh, in your mind you can take yourself to T intersections, things like that, we're allowed to go up to 5% because PROAG has acknowledged these are places where cars can free flow. They have a green light, they don't have any requirement to slow down. And if we broke grade so starkly to 2%, that could create safety issues on another level. So we do get up to 5% at those locations. And then at mid-block crossings, those are the only locations where whatever the current grade of the road is, we're allowed to have a cross slope of our connecting facility at the same grade. So hopefully that helps clarify that a little bit. I get this question, asked this question frequently, does a ramp width have to equal the walk width? Well, for a shared use path, if you look over to the right there, 304512, it does. For a shared use path, the ramp or the planted transition has to equal the width of the path. But when we're in the other pedestrian circulation paths like the sidewalks, you can go down to a four foot minimum. That's the absolute bare minimum. Realizing city, county, or states may have different rules or requirements and they may not want to allow a four foot minimum. But as PROAG is written, you can go down to four foot. And where that will come in, in use is, you know, we're, we're up against monuments for uh, 
subdivision entrances or poles, light poles, light facilities. Um, we tend to have a very little limited right-of-way space out there. You may have a signalized cabinet over there. Um, knowing that you can take your five-foot sidewalk, your six-foot sidewalk down to this four-foot entrance is, is something that PROAG allows and can help achieve compliance at an intersection. So we share that. Grade breaks, perpendicular to the direction of travel. So look at the picture on the left. Those domes are installed radially. And generally, when we have that happen, we know the grade break will be behind them. So what that's telling you is that slab of concrete that those domes are on are at the same grade and cross slope of that street approach. And we don't start climbing until we get beyond them. By doing that, two wheels start climbing at the same time. And at the top, two wheels get off the climb at the same time, that's good. Same thing on the right, we got these domes are installed on the ramp. So you'll hear me say domes on radius or domes on ramp. When the domes are on the ramp, the grade break is in front of them. So you see that yellow line is in front of them, where the picture on the left is behind them. So that kind of helps clarify where those two go. Running slopes, um, just realize that's the slope that's going up and downhill. And in Pro Ag, we are allowed to have our grade equal the general grade of the road. And that's important to know. And then you also look at that bottom bullet. When we talk about ramp conditions, we're talking about a slope that's between 5% and 8.3. But also note that ramps aren't required to chase grade forever. So if you cannot hold 8.3 and 15 foot or longer, you're allowed to exceed that. Just don't have a 14 foot ramp at 9% have a 16 foot ramp at 9%, that would be compliant. 14 foot at 9% is not compliant. If you're 15 foot or less, 8.3 is your max. Cross slope, 2% everywhere except at those intersections with stopper yield control. We got without stopper yield control, we're allowed to go up to five. Something that you're also allowed to do is if the street crossing is allowed to be five because you're at a uh, signalized intersection. Then your ramp that ties into it is also allowed to be 5% cross slope max. And so is your turning space behind it. You're allowed to carry that up through so that we're not creating a warping situation while climbing a ramp. And then of course in mid block crossings, it can equal the grade of the road. Here's a pictorial. Pretend that you live in this subdivision off to the right here. So that 2% max, that's, that's your subdivision, you're coming up to your stop sign and the arterial road you're getting ready to turn on does not have any stop sign. So your approach can only be a maximum of 2% because cars have to slow down and stop. So you're not gonna get any bottom out effect. But here you've got the 5% max on the arterial through. So if that road's falling at 6%, we need to take that down to five but we also can have our ramp that ties into that to be 5% and see how it carries up into the uh, turning space. That's allowed to be 5%. And then behind it, you transition back to 2%. So you're gonna do your, your warp or your transition on that sidewalk grade, not while you're climbing up a ramp. So that's, that's a good way to go about that. Here's a pictorial of a sky view of it. As you see, we've got a subdivision street, kind of like the picture we just talked about. You got a lane of traffic. That sidewalk is a lane of traffic coming down that subdivision. And on that arterial, we've got a pedestrian access route going either way. So those are our lanes of traffic. But on the other side of that intersection, there is not a pedestrian facility. So we don't have a, a crossing or a connection here. But as you look at this one, this is something that's been uh, missed over uh, under thought throughout the years. And what we're talking about here is these receiving ramps. So look at that Amsdale court. As you come down that, you have what we would define as, follow my cursor, we got a lane of traffic. And as that lane of traffic comes down to that curb ramp that we have to install, we are at a crosswalk. And here's something that may be, um, you may be unaware of. Crosswalks exist at the intersection of a street and a street, even in the absence of sidewalk. That's where pedestrians have the right of way to cross. So this crosswalk actually does exist there. And we've, we've created this entrance because we have to, 
and we've got a lane of traffic on the other side of the road. So if we don't install this receiving ramp over here, what we're essentially saying is, if if you're able, if you live in house A and you wanna go visit your friend in house B, and you can go walk across the street, you can just hop over that grass and go say hi. But if if we don't put in those ramps, what we're telling them is, you need to go 1,700 feet down to the signalized intersection, hit the button where I want you to cross, and then come 1,700 feet back. That is the discrimination that started the whole thing. We can't, we can't tell one person it's okay to just go across that street because that's a legal crosswalk, uh, but not give access to the other, other folks. So that's what, when we build these receiving ramps, it's so important to understand what their purpose is for. And I show this just to say, be careful. These ramps are out there all over the place and I myself have installed more than a few in my time. When you take two pedestrian paths, you look at the picture in the upper right, that's the same spot we were just at. If we do not build those receiving ramps and we just say, well, we want you to go down to that button and we're gonna block off this other side. You're intentionally putting a barrier to access in. And what I've been told is, if you do this, you need to install a sign that says no pedestrian crossing is allowed. Because again, there is a legal crosswalk there, striped or unstriped. And if we don't allow them access to the other side, then we shouldn't allow access for anybody to that other side. So just be careful when we build these and, and we shut off one of the two directions. Detectable warnings, they are two foot in the direction of travel. Uh, and they need to follow up the curb line too. So you look at that picture on the right. We need to be two foot up that curb line. We cannot be short two feet in the direction at any point. And another thing that I'll just share, right now the guidance says they're two foot minimum. Well, I've also been shared that their updated guidelines somewhere down the road may also end up saying two foot max and min, such that we don't want domes to be at one location two foot deep, next location three, next location six varying depths of domes can become problematic uh, for people to understand how many strides away they are from, from danger. And that's what they're doing, they're tactile warnings. They're letting somebody know they're leaving a place of safety and they're gonna enter a place of danger or vice versa. So if we create an inconsistent message with depths, um, that can be a problem. But as written right now, it does just say two foot minimum that I've, that I've seen. So here's detectable warnings installed in a cut through, slightly different. And at, at a cut through, we need to install them at the face of curb. When we're at curb ramps, we install them six to eight inches behind the face of curb. So slightly different um, to note those two. And you can see in this, they put the border around it. So they've got a two inch border to allow water to drain through. And that just helps keep the silt from building up as much. Here's a situation where we've got uh, detectable warnings. And when we talk about installing them in refuge places, we need to make sure we have six feet of refuge because that's the requirement. If we do not have six feet, we do not put any domes down because we do not have what we consider to be refuge. So on this one example where you got the domes, two foot of space and then two foot of domes, that's good. So if somebody steps on those, they realize, okay, next step is on pavement and I'm out, out of danger. Up oh, next steps on domes, I'm entering danger again. If we dome the entire section, like this looks to be about four foot, when somebody steps on those domes, they think the next time they hit flat pavement, they're out of danger. And in this case, they would be in traffic. So we wanna be sure that we know if we don't have six foot, we don't dome anything because we do not have refuge. And domes can be glued down to apparatus. Comical picture, make sure we align it up when we're done. Domes on radius and ramp we talked about. When our domes are on the radius like this, we know our grade break is gonna be behind them. So this whole area, the domes, that's gonna be flat. And when I say flat, I mean maximum 2% by 2% at, at a stop sign. And I mean maximum 5% by 5% at a signalized intersection. Down here, we got domes on the ramp. Still, what that tells me is this little triangle of concrete in front of them needs to be at the same grade and cross slope as that approach is. Else I'll be climbing a ramp on a radius and that's not good. 
Here's just showing that first picture again that I talked about. If you look at this picture straight out of ProAg in the upper right, that's what I meant by indenting. We should have indented that uh, tabled approach all the way up to where those domes start. If we would have done that, we would have had a nice, consistent grade and cross slope all the way up to the point where we start climbing. And then two wheels would have climbed at the exact same time. And you wouldn't have seen wheels come off the ground like you did in my video. Here's just a better look at that. So that's domes on radius, and you can clearly see the grade break starts behind them. Those two slabs, the sidewalk there, are the ramp, and they are climbing with grade breaks perpendicular to the direction of travel. Very important. Turning space exists where we need turning movements, and the requirements for that are 2% by 2% maximum and at stop signs, and 5% by 5% when wherever we're at places without stop or yield control. Clear space, we hit on a little bit, that's space. So that's when you come off that flume, you need a place to gather your composure where you're not running into obstacles or vehicles. So if you look at this, this is a picture out of ProAg. Picture on the left is indented in. So they've got some of their four by four starting behind the curb line. And that's probably useful for them, that's helping. Because that picture on the right, most of that clear space is, is out in the road. So in this situation, what I would recommend doing is I would take those cr uh, striped crosswalks and I would erase four foot off the curb line for each of those and I would connect them. That way you are telling the traffic where the pedestrians are at. You're creating a, a space for them that should be just for them. So that's a way to handle that. And here, if it works again, I'm going to show you another video. This picture on the right is from Indianapolis. It's at their cultural trail. It's a fabulous facility if you get a chance to check it out. It's about six miles constructed for multimodal use. And what they did is they favored the most vulnerable user. And they, they lifted up the entire intersection. So this isn't just a tabled crosswalk. This is an entire tabled intersection. And what I want you to watch is the cars. They go up and over. You see that jogger in the picture right there? He never went up or down a ramp. Those domes, that's a blended transition. That concrete is at the exact same grade as that crosswalk. And it's the cars that go up and over at this intersection. It's also a pretty good design for your uh, drainage purposes as well. You know where to install your inlets. And then you don't get snow piling up during the winter on your pedestrian path either. So we're going to see if I can get this to play. And here we go. We turned the volume down intentionally on this one so you can kind of see the car. See how they go up and over? You can watch that curb line. Uh, in the right hand corner it disappears into the crosswalk because it's the cars that go up and over. So this is a very, very good design. Okay. So here is Seattle. So anybody who says we can't table hilly urban America clearly hasn't been to San Francisco or Seattle. You climb mountains, look at that building. It's disappearing into the climb. But the intersection where the pedestrians and everybody's crossing, that's generally flat. And that's what's required. And I'll even emphasize that with this. This is straight out of ProAg where they talk about the impact state and local governments. You see that highlighted section. This requirement will have more than minimal impact on the design and construction of newly tabled intersections in hilly urban areas that contain pedestrian street crossings. So we do need to include this in our transition plan and these intersections do need to be a part of it because that's where the pedestrians are most vulnerable. That's where they're up against the cars. And if you're doing a rehabilitation project and, and all your budget or your scope has is to do the ramps, well, we need to build them to compliance. So how do we connect them to streets that, that aren't compliant? And ProAg talks about that as well. It's a transitional segment. So in R20232, 
uh, we need to connect our compliant facility to the non-compliant facility. And I take this opportunity just to share, as you're looking at this, um, what, what we did on ramps like this, that's a 2% maximum cross slope uh, curb ramp right there. And that street was falling at about 7%. So to connect the dots, we chose to go 1% per foot in transition. So we went from 2% out a foot into the pavement to 3%, two feet out in the pavement, we were at 4%. And we carried that on until we matched whatever the current street is doing. So here's a great opportunity because I believe compliance starts at the planning level. Um, we need to plan for the right budget and the right scope of project. Because if we're limited on funds by the time it comes to the design, we need to do things like this. And the reality is, um, once you start replacing that much of, of an entrance, you might not have to pay much more just to table the whole darn thing. And, and then you're not chasing orphan pieces of compliance out in the right of way. So at the planning stage, I think whenever we're doing these ramps, that's the time to plan to table our approaches to. You've got all the work going, you've got the concrete crews in, um, it's a great time to get that done. So what about roundabouts? Well, roundabouts could be talked about for an entire hour. Roundabouts are just as important as every other intersection and extremely challenging for folks with uh, visual disabilities. They, they learn how to hear for gaps and, and cues on when it's safe to travel. And where we've got continuous movement, that can be challenging. So we still are required to make accessible um, intersections and some ways that we can do that is is by installing the buttons for the pedestrians so that they can queue up a safe time to, to cross and we can bring highlight to their crosswalk with colored concrete like in this this picture i'm also a fan of these staggered approaches i think that one that allows for stacking um, two depending on how you do it uh, it it allows for the pedestrians to be looking at the traffic as they approach their crossing. So they, these are just a few ways that we can make an accessible roundabout. Um, but the more we highlight the pedestrians, and again, roundabouts by their very nature are traffic calming measures, and the public for years have been used to stopping at intersections. So it, it's not a leap for us as, as planners and traffic engineers and designers to put these buttons in and, and expect the public to allow the safe crossings or this safe coexistence between multiple modes of transportation. And what about those trails we talked about? Absolutely. You know, it's kind of a joke picture. I'm not insinuating you continuously reinforce all of your shared use paths, but I do strongly suggest in the understanding of ADA compliance and, and the tight tolerances of you know, a 2% maximum cross slope, I would strongly suggest that we all consider putting rock underneath our concrete sidewalks. And I would strongly suggest that we stick with concrete sidewalks, not just on sidewalks, but also on trails, just so that we don't get into these situations where, you know, the earth's freeze thaw fluctuates and we will be out of compliance extremely quickly. So we're not looking for compliance at day one, we're looking at compliance throughout the life of the facility. And uh, if, if we don't have that, then we have a maintenance responsibility and an obligation to go out there and, and upgrade it. So um, a lot of places use concrete for the past for that very reason. I, I would strongly suggest you consider it because the price is about the same. So whether you're doing four inches on four or three inches on eight, it's gonna end up being around the same. So just food for thought. And then when you're using a smart level, make sure that it's defaulting to the right setting. You wanna be in percent. If, if you build a ramp to two degrees, you're actually at about 3.7%. Uh, that's cost the lives of more than a few ramps that I know of. So make sure the smart level's in the right setting. And where do we put our buttons? I'm going to really quickly highlight this as another conversation that we could get deeper into, but PROAG defaults to MUTCD on this one, because the way I feel the default goes is it's more of a function uh, of traffic engineering than it is of necessarily accessibility. Reason behind that is um, the further back the button, the more time you need to give to the pedestrian signal and crossing. 
And the more time you give to that, the less time you give to the green light phase. So the further back we go, the, the less time for the cars. So as you look at MUTCD in this graphic, which is most commonly the one used, they allow us to put the button five foot off of the crosswalk and up to six feet back. Notice we can't put it in the first foot and a half. And it says six foot max. So that only leaves four and a half foot to place your button. And that has scratched the heads of many engineers throughout the country. But notice down there in the notes, that, that number one note there, it allows to go up to 10 feet if it's impractical. And here's what I'd say to that. In my practice, I quite often am exceeding that six and using that 10 or up to 10. Because if you look at this intersection where I really wanna put my pedestrian button is back here in the flat area. Because when we're only allowed one and a half feet to six foot, those buttons are gonna be located in the ramp, that five to 8.3%. And in that situation, taking one hand off the wheel to hit the button can be very challenging. And I have done it, so I know. So MUTCD allows us to go back to 10. By doing that, you can create a flat spot for people to comfortably, accessibly hit that button. And all you're really doing, a pedestrian moves at three and a half uh, feet per second. So by going back four extra feet, you're adding one second to the crossing, but a whole world of difference to their experience. So I do encourage that. Which is gonna take us into some good, bad, and uglies. That's not compliant. And we need to have conversations with our utility folks out there because they're gonna be a big part of this compliance with us. Whether they're doing their own project and they need to be taught how to compliantly put it back or whether our project requires them to move. Um, we're in a lane of traffic and we certainly would move it for the cars. We need to move it for the people. And we need to make sure when we're building new projects, we're not setting ourselves up for failure right out of the gate. And I agree with this. I don't want water to pond up on the ramp, but I don't think that's probably the right way to go about it. We have alternate solutions we can do out there. And this one works. Now I will say that we don't want to make a habit of putting grates in the curb line, but if that's what it takes to get water to move and keep a ramp safe and slip resistant, um, in alterations, this is something that, that we may need to consider. In new design, we can design around it and not have this issue. But in alterations, there's a lot of projects out there where people are seeing puddles and wondering how, how they can get, get water to move. Here, we have an intersection with two striped crosswalks. And we got that yellow button right there on the uh, pole. So nobody in a wheelchair is gonna be able to hit that button. And that's just clearly terribly unsafe. We need to build alcoves, even if there's no other path at that quadrant. We need to get people compliantly to that button, safely out of traffic, access equals safety. And this isn't good for anybody. So I just remind you, as, as we maintain our roads, as, as we try and get more life out of them, we have to be thinking about the ADA component of it as well. Because we already have a situation where we got grade dropping the road in a, cur in a curb line. And that presents enough problems with water. When we start pinching two, three, four, five inches on top of the existing old road and necking it down at the sidewalks, we create these duck ponds. That is most definitely not compliant. We need water to move. Um, firm, stable, and slip resistant is the rule. And this clearly doesn't fit into slip resistant. This is what we're after. You look at that facility, that's outside my hotel window at that same cultural trail. The intersection you're looking at is the one that was lifted up in the air, favoring the most vulnerable user. You got clear lanes of traffic for the pedestrians, safe access in and out of the streets. Um, this, is, this is what we're trying to get to. And we've, we've come a long way, we really have. And, and we thank you for the time. And next week, we're gonna give you a little bit of the Wisconsin and Missouri story. And we'll also show you a, a curb ramp layout uh, live in, in a PowerPoint presentation. So I've kind of put my brain on paper and you'll get to see what I'm looking at when I go out to an intersection and want to bring something up to compliance. And we have a little quick reference guide that we'll share with everybody who signs up for session two. Um, just a little front and back pager that you can take out into the field and, and give you some good guidance based on 
pro-ag requirements. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Bill. 